Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Moore. I am an engineer with the NRCS. I also have Travis Buckley and Drew Zelli with me. Um, you'll be hearing from them later. We're here to talk today about cold weather concrete. All right, the topics we're going to cover today, we want to define what we mean by cold weather concrete, give you a reason to care, because if you don't care, you're probably not going to remember. Um, then we're going to talk about, spend a lot of time talking about the requirements of spec, NRCS Spec 4, which is the concrete spec. And specifically with cold weather concrete, what changes should you see in the concrete mix, what changes you should see in the construction practices, and what changes that you as inspectors need to um, need to do when in your inspection. I um, should note that our intended audience for this presentation is those of you that do cold weather concrete inspection, mainly our NRCS technicians and LCD technicians. Um, so that's the emphasis that we're using in this presentation. So straight out of spec four, uh, cold weather concrete is yeah, spec 4 defines it as when the minimum air temperature at a local job site is less than 35 degrees Fahrenheit, um, forecast temperature and verified with a maximum minimum thermometer at the start of the morning shift. Uh, just to note, make sure that your con don't just say spec or cold weather concrete to your contractor. Make sure you, they know spec 4. Uh, there's a couple of different cold weather concrete standards out there. There's ACI 306, the residential guys have a different standard, and they all say something a little bit different. So don't assume that everyone knows what you're talking about when you say cold weather concrete. Make sure you bring the, these requirements forward because there are different requirements that are, that are out there. So basically cold weather damage is concrete. Um, water in the concrete mix can freeze if it gets too cold, and that freezing both when the water is frozen, it doesn't hydrate the cement anymore. And water expands as it freezes, which causes internal damage to the concrete. Uh, water expands 9 to 10% when it goes from a liquid to a solid, and it forces open cracks in your concrete. Sometimes you can't see the damage that you've done to the concrete. Um, so once you freeze concrete, it's not as watertight. And it's susceptible to subsequent free thaw damage. If you look at the images that we gave you here, um, one of these cylinders has been cured correctly. You can see this one's been frozen completely. If you froze, freeze it before 500 PSI, you get up to a 50% loss in strength. Um, and you get delayed cure times. And it takes about a third as long to cure per 10 degrees that you are off the norm. Um, one of the things that if you do enough cold weather concrete, you're going to get this comment. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, as long as I get 500 PSI, it doesn't matter. That's actually not true. Um, it is true that if you get 500 PSI of strength in your concrete before you freeze the concrete, that you can get close to mixed design strengths. That part is true. However, once you freeze concrete, you open up these micro fissures in the concrete. So it's not as watertight, and it's not as durable, and it's, it will see more freeze thaw damage in the future. So those of you that do a lot of NRCS concrete, that should really catch your ear, because NRCS, the way we use concrete, we're really as concerned about its durability and its lack of permeability as we are about its strength. We use concrete as a liner. And so, yeah, you, you'll get the strength, but you'll lose the permeability and you'll lose the freeze thaw durability. So how many times do we actually place concrete that we don't care if it leaks and we don't care that it can't stand up to winter conditions? I've never seen us do it. So, you know, those are the three criteria and you lose two of the three if you freeze your concrete even once. Um, so the, you are, the contractor is right if they tell you that if if I get 500 PSI, I can still get strength. That's true, but you've lost your permeability and you've lost your, three, your freeze thaw durability, which is why Spec 4 is written the way it is. 
This is just a photo of a uh, microfisher. You can tell we're zoomed way in on this picture. Um, you can see the individual grains of sand, but you can see these are these little cracks that we're talking about that form within the concrete that give you the permeability problems if you freeze your concrete. And then frozen concrete damage looks a heck of a lot like freeze-thaw damage because it's what it is. It just happens a lot faster. So a couple of photos that I threw in here to show you some of the damage that you'll see either right away or in the future. Um, down here, this is scaling and spalling. It looks like it's flaking out. Um, you do have some, some scaling in the corners here. You have some crumbling and you have cracking. So if you freeze your concrete, you've damaged it. You don't want to freeze it. That's why we have spec four, the spec four cold weather concrete requirements. Fortunately, you do have something working in your favor. Um, concrete cures, and as it cure, it doesn't dry, it cures. And as it cures, that's a chemical reaction that kicks off some heat. So you, if you can capture that heat, you can keep your concrete curing. And that's some of the protection requirements that you're going to hear about from uh, Travis and Drew. I'm going to hand this over to Travis, who's going to talk to you about some concrete material requirements. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Travis Buckley. Um, I'm the DADCAP area engineer out of Appleton. And I'm going to give a little more in-depth uh, spec for um, specifically with the concrete materials. Um, just to reiterate, reiterate, we are talking about Wisconsin Construction Specification 4, which is the concrete spec and version 315. Uh, if you don't have the current version, uh, it's available on the Wisconsin NRCS website, section 4 of the Field Office Tech Guide. So I highly suggest you get the most current version. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, concrete materials and temperature, um, some curing period requirements in spec 4, and then some other materials um, that may be involved that we need to be cognizant of. Um, concrete mixing, uh, spec 4 requires that when the cement is added to the mix at the plant, that the temperature of the mixing water not exceed 100 degrees. And the same thing with the aggregate, you know, when the cement's added at the plant, that temperature uh, of the aggregate needs to be less than 100 degrees. Now, this is something you need to coordinate with your concrete or your cement supplier, your concrete supplier, and the contractor, making sure that the plant is aware of these requirements and you know that and whose responsibility it's going to be to make sure that this is met. Uh, concrete placement and transport, there's also some temperature requirements for that too. At no time during the production or transport of the concrete shall the temperature exceed 80 degrees. So this is during trucking, uh, you know, basically the concrete can't be too hot when it's coming from the plant. Well, on the flip side of that, um, the tricky part is at the time of placement, the concrete has to be greater than 55 degrees. So you have this window between 80 and 55 that you need to get the concrete from the plant and get it placed. A curing period. Uh, spec 4 specifies in a cold weather environment that you need a curing period of seven days. Now, when we're talking about temperature of the curing period, we're talking about the air temperature adjacent to the concrete surface. And at no time during the first 10 days after concrete is placed, temperature can be below 32 degrees. So basically, we've got to keep the concrete above freezing for the first 10 days. We also need to make sure that the temperature stays above 40 degrees adjacent to the concrete for seven days, for seven accumulated days, and those seven days have to occur within the first 10 days. So not to confuse anybody, but it's seven days greater than 40 degrees within the first 10 days. And so it, Basically, you get a curing period of seven cumulative days, and that's the key word there, cumulative days. It's not seven adjacent days or anything like that. It's seven cumulative days. Uh, we also need to be, uh, when the curing period is done, we also need to be aware that 
the concrete has to cool gradually. Spec 4 actually specifies that the maximum temperature decrease of the concrete surface cannot decrease by more than 40 degrees in a 24-hour period. So when we protect our concrete or if you're heating your concrete, make sure that at the end of the curing period that the concrete is cooled down gradually. Uh, I know in you know cold cold weather concreting type of situations or that type of year, you know, seven cumulative days can be difficult to get. And a lot of times we're dealing with fairly short windows. So there are a couple strategies we can use to get our curing period down. And one of those is to utilize type three cement. And type three cement is basically type one cement. It's it's similar both physically and chemically, you know, the characteristics, but um, it yields a higher strength in a shorter period of time. And it, it does that because it's it's ground finer. So basically it's uh, type one cement that's ground finer, so the smaller particles so it can react quicker in that hydration process. And that uh, graph on the on the slide there you can see that you know type three cement is that top line so you get higher higher compressive strength in a shorter period of time. Um, this, you know, you can also do it by adding more cement, but um, spec four specifically specifies type three, and you know, type three is probably could be more cost effective than adding additional cement. We um, just need to make sure that uh, if you are using type three cement, that it meets ASTM C150, just like all all other types of cement. And like I said, you can reduce your curing period to three consecutive days. Now the keyword there is consecutive. You know, we had seven cumulative days, but now we're talking about three consecutive days. So much smaller window, but you can. But it has to be consecutive days. Another strategy to get your curing periods reduced is to utilize an accelerating admixture. Basically, these are chemicals you can put in the concrete mix that are going to increase your set time and give you a higher strength in a shorter period of time. There's a ton of these out there. Uh, I got a few examples on there. There's Super Set, NC, Polychem, Super Set 3, Master Set, FP20. So the list goes on. But um, the key thing here is making sure that whatever admixture you use conforms to ASTM C. 494 type C and it's non-chloride. That's probably the most important thing. You know, you know, make sure that you're coordinating with your concrete supplier or contractor that you are verifying this ahead of time. Is chloride is a concern because it accelerates the corrosion of your steel. Um, that's that's why that's key. But basically, just make sure that you know ahead of time what's going to be in your concrete mix if you are going to be using the admixture and that it is verified that it meets spec 4, which is the ASTM 494 type C. The other thing we need to be aware of and be thinking of is, is other materials we use on a concrete job in addition to just the concrete. Uh, a big one is expansive water stop. It's fairly common fairly common material we use with a lot of our concrete jobs, but it, it is also affected by a cold weather situation. For example, a Cicus well, which is a product many of us have used or at least are familiar with, the recommended minimum application temperature for Cicus well is 50 degrees. So if you're doing a concrete job where you're having temperatures right around that 40 degree mark, Cicus well might not be acceptable material anymore. So to be aware of that and in addition uh, the optimum application or for optimum application a uh, Cicus well needs to be stored at 70 degrees for at least eight hours prior to use. So if you are about at right at that 50 degree mark but your Cicus well could be sitting out at the job site overnight, you know, it might not be you know, the best condition to put that stuff on you know, even though you're at that 50 degree mark. So, so just be aware of what you're using. You know, 
again, coordinate with your contractor so the materials can be checked. You know, this is obviously something you need to do prior to them putting the expanse water stop down. You know, obviously the sooner you can check labels and, you know, if you have to make substitutions, the better. Um, the other thing with expansive water stop is typically colder temperatures require a longer curing period for those type of materials. So you might have to stretch out, you know, when concrete is placed and when those materials, um, to allow those materials to cure. Now, another thing you need to be aware of are repair materials. When I talk about repair, I'm meaning, you know, surface defects like honeycombing or form tie holes, uh, materials like that to, to do surface repairs. So we're talking about site mixed, you know, Portland cement mortar, bonding grouts, um, epoxy mortars and epoxy type compounds. You know, all those products or all those materials have or could have temperature specific requirements. So the take home here is follow the manufacturer's recommendations. And that starts with coordinating with your contractor and making sure you're aware of what's going to be used on the job and look at it ahead of time and make sure that what the manufacturer says is going to, you're going to have those conditions um, on the job site. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Drew to uh, finish it up. Good morning. I'm Drew Zelli. I'm the DACAP engineering specialist up here in Appleton. And I've been doing this line of work for, for many years. And we're going to talk about inspection. And a lot of the issues and the items that I'm going to talk about today are, are things you already know. It's, it's, it's more of a refresher. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about yet is cost. So once you go into this cold weather concreting, first of all, let's, let's determine for sure whether we're, we're in a cold weather environment, which is defined by spec four. But you want to make sure that, that we actually are into it. Now, I looked at the forecast here in Appleton before I, before I got on the website. And next week here in Appleton, we're going to be in a cold weather environment because we're going to be below, be below 35 degrees. And what I'm getting at is you really want to forecast this cold weather concreting portion of spec for You want to plan for it. You really want to spend the time up front planning because it's going to re require an increase in cost of 20 to 30 percent for the landowner. When I'm working with technicians and they say, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this project in November or December, I, my, first, my gut reaction is, why? Why do we need to do this cold weather concreting? I, I try to avoid it whenever I possibly can because there's high risk involved. There's high cost involved for the same value that I would get for doing this job in April, May, June. So if you can avoid cold weather concreting, and my advice to you is to do it, especially the, line, the types of projects that we do. If you're doing tanks or transfer systems, those are jobs that are easier to, to do in cold weather concreting, but some of our, 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 our line pits, there's just a lot of risk involved in, in not meeting the specification at the end, of the end of the project. The biggest thing that you can possibly do in this cold weather concrete environment is to spend the time on your pre-construction conference. Communication is probably the number one cause of significant emotional events on the job site not prior planned, have, having not the, the right equipment. So you really want to spend more time on the pre-construction conference to talk through and to plan for any types of surprises in the weather. If I was doing a job today, even though I, you know, it's going to be 73 degrees up here in Appleton, I'm going to start planning for my cold weather environment, which is going to happen next Wednesday. And, and, and I've, basically, I've got a list on this slide of, of all the questions that you can ask. You, there's probably plenty more that you can add to it, but, but it, it really makes you focus on what you've got to talk about. I go to the point where I actually develop an agenda for cold weather concreting. I list all my questions. I get the names of the products, just like Travis had mentioned. I make sure that the products can actually work in the, in the, in the environment that I'm in. And I actually have a sign-off uh, uh, or a place to initial it so that contractors can initial that, yes, I'm read it, I'm aware of this, and, and, and if I'm going to sub this down to a subcontractor, I've got to pass this information down to this. All this 
does is it fosters that communication. You want to make sure that you've got the materials on site to, to maintain the temperature. Whatever they happen to be, whether it's straw, whether it's blankets, whether it's a heater, you know, who is going to record the temperatures? That's an inspection requirement. The specification says the contractor has to. In some cases, it's going to be the technician. Can I maintain that sub-base? Can I, can I keep it unfrozen? Is it going to snow tomorrow? If it snows tomorrow, how am I going to get that snow off there, and how am I going to handle the, the excess moisture? Do I have to adjust my mix maybe due to, to a thawing condition? You know, can the water stop? Travis talked about requirements. Water stop have, depending on the product, have various different temperatures that they can actually to function in. Do you have the right tools? You've got a maximum minimum thermometer. You've got to have a couple. For some reason, they get broken on the job quite a few times. But you want to have plenty of maximum minimum thermometers on the site and have them there ahead of time. Don't be ordering ordering them at the time of construction. Have an infrared thermometer. It's a handy tool. You know, are you going to change your concrete mix? A lot of contractors are going to add the accelerators, which is an awesome, awesome way to go. But make sure that that accelerator is pre-approved and pull that cut sheet out and make sure there's no calcium chloride in there. You don't want to get that batch ticket that, that says CCA at the bottom during the time of pour. That, that, that causes issues. Um, and then again, make sure the landowner is aware of the increase in cost. It, it, this is going to be an expensive to 20 to 30 percent. You know, increased in cost, and, and is, this, is this something that maybe you can push off into a, to a better environment? Uh, thermometers, like I just mentioned, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I personally like the infrared thermometer. I can take my sub-base, I can you know, shoot and, and record that documentation. Those maximum minimum thermometers, those are fairly cheap. The one on the right, that's like a $15 purchase. Um, they're fairly fragile. They do get broken around. They do get blown. They can get wrapped up in, in blankets when you stick it underneath a, you know, concrete blankets. Um, so it's a good idea to have several of them on the site. I wish I could tell you how many you need to place. That's kind of a question that I get is how many thermometers do I need? But you, yeah, you know, I, I wish I could say there's this general rule, one per 15,000, but there, there's really not. You need to make sure that you can record the temperatures so you can meet the specification. I generally place my thermometers at the edges because that's where you're going to have a, a lot more exposure to the cold, and then I place them in the center. Uh, but again, they're fairly cheap, and, and if, you, if you need to, please contact me and I'll, and I'll get you a list of places to buy them. Um, inspection for requirements for temperature. It's fairly straightforward. The specification, and, and again, we're always referenced specification number four, uh, the, the spec four is fairly, fairly, fairly specific. You've got to record the daily temperature of the job site. The specification says the contractor's responsibility to do that. How you determine that at the pre-construction conference, sometimes a technician will want to do that. Uh, I recommend you have the contractor, but you need a written log, whether it's a digitally written log, but I always like something in writing. How you document, I use a job book or I use a bound book with, with, with uh, pencil annotations however you need to do it, but it has to be written down so you've got that evidence after the fact. You can say, hey, this concrete was poured at this such and such a time, it was poured at these temperatures, here's the, the daily temperatures you know, during, during the pour and the minimum temperatures. That way, if you've got a problem or if you do get to the point where you've got concrete that has gotten below 32 degrees, then we can start mitigating it out based off of what the site conditions are. Um, Again, the, the specification is, 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 is fairly straightforward. The, the, the air adjacent to the concrete has is, is got to be, can't be less than 32 degrees for the first 10 days and maintain 40 degrees for the seven accumulated days. I don't want to reread the specification. Temperature's got to be at 55. All this stuff you, you need either, either need to physically measure or have somebody physically measure it for you and then document that in your field notes. You want, to, uh, you want to verify that the sub-base is frozen and not frozen at time of placement. That's where that, thir that, that, that uh, infrared thermometer is an ideal thing. You take a couple of point and shoots because uh, that is one thing that kind of gets forgotten. You know, you're, you're focusing on placing the concrete and, and maintaining the concrete. And, well, by the way, the sub-base froze last night. Boy, that's going to be a problem. So you, you, you want to plan your pours out or plan the project out so that that sub-base for future pours doesn't get frozen too. Uh, and again, documentation could be a written log of temperatures, field notes, however you do it, but it has to be uh, some type of document that, that can be seen after the job. Um, options to main temperature. This is one thing that I do not specify to the contractor. What I've shown you on, the, on this uh, um, slide here is, is what Bob Wilson had done for one of his old poop scoops. These are recommendations, but I throw the onus back to the contractor because I, I, I truly believe that the concrete contractor is the expert here. I throw them 
throw it back on them to decide what they're going to use for uh, um, insulation, whether whether it's whether it's a, a thermal blanket, whether they're going to bring in a, a heater, or whether they're just going to add straw. I, I really throw that back on the contractor, and I and I want them to own that project. I, uh, a lot of the first question I usually get asked is. Do we need to cover it? My, my general response is, you tell me whether we need to cover it. What I need is I need the concrete to maintain this temperature. If, if you can do it without coverage, knock yourself out. But bear in mind, we don't get second chances with, with cold weather concrete. So it, it's better to over-insulate and over-plan for it than not. Um, these are just some slides of some typical jobs that we've done in the winter. Uh, I try to avoid this at all possible, but but you know the one on the right is is you know, insulating the sub is the sub base with with a heater and the, and the one on the left you can see we we've covered it with the um, insulating blankets. Notice the tires. One of the things that we you need to discuss at the pre-construction conference is the maintenance of your coverage. It's great to put the stuff down the, and the day after it cover it with straw, but you've got to maintain that for a period of time. You may have to maintain it you know during a period of weekends or over a holiday. Uh, where you don't have a contractor out there on a daily basis, who is going to maintain my coverage for that curing compound or for that curing period? Excuse me. Yeah, that 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 really needs to be called out in the pre-construction conference. Whether it's the landowner, you know, and typically we're dealing with farmers who've got a million other things they've got to do. Um, make sure that somebody's got that maintenance of that because all it's going to do is take that one instance in time to get below our temperature, and then we've got an issue. Um, Again, there's no set requirements for coverage in the standard. You need to maintain the temperatures. I throw that back on a contractor. The, the, the contractor's responsibility for the sub-base. And again, the maintenance. I cannot overemphasize emphasize the maintenance and future planning. If you look on the slide on, on the left, you can see we, we, we've got these slabs covered. They also have to plan for that uh, sub-base on those future pours so they don't get uh, frozen up to them. Mixed design. It, Travis covered it quite a bit in detail. The only thing that I really want to emphasize here is with cold weather concrete, you've got to follow everything that is required in WCS number four, as you would in a warm weather environment, plus you're going to start dealing with your admixtures. One of the key things is make sure the admixture doesn't contain calcium chloride. And what I do is I get the cut sheet from the manufacturer, from the supplier, yeah, and, and this is just a typical example of it in this slide that says there is no calcium chloride added into that. That becomes part of my documentation for the mix. That 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 I, gets you know put in the job file and 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 I'm good to go. To summarize, uh, again, the biggest thing that I really want to emphasize is you've got to prepare for the cold weather concrete in your pre-construction conference. Look at the project. Look at all the components you're going to have, the changes in the mix design, the water stop, the sub-base requirements, the coverage co coverage of the concrete, who's going to maintain the temperatures, who's going to maintain the coverage during the curing compound. Have all that stuff ironed out. I actually recommend, like I said before, put it into a written agenda so that the contractor can say, okay, what do I need to do? You want to keep it as simple as possible. You know, this is what I need to do. This is what this is my task list. And that way everybody knows what's going on. That communication is really going to save you down the road. The last thing you want to do is have somebody look at their iPhone and say, oh, it's going to be cold tonight. Do we got to cover it? By then, you know, we're, 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 we're in scramble mode. And you really want to avoid that with a cold weather concrete, uh, especially due to the cost. You want to verify that mix design. You've got seven days per the specification. Use it. You don't want to do a la last minute point where hey we're going to add a we're going to add an accelerator and then we've got to scramble for that cut sheet plan for that stuff ahead of time don't forget about the sub base and maintain and document your temperatures if you've got any doubts in all these components in this cold weather concrete don't pour the concrete i can't emphasize that enough uh, I, I, in a, many cases our, our 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 projects are not that time sensitive that it's it, we can't avoid can't afford to wait for a better day and, and, and not pour the concrete. Um, if there's any doubt in the communication, the communication should break down. And make sure this is getting down to the lowest levels, the subcontractors. Um, if there's any doubt in it, don't pour the concrete. Once the concrete is froze or once it's got below that 32 degrees, then you know then we've got to go into mitigation. And, and, and mitigation could result in, 
you know, worst case scenario, we've got to replace the concrete. Best case scenario, we, we make no change. But that, that is yet to be determined. However, that is one of the reasons why you do document all this stuff, have all this documentation to, uh, available so we can use that to, to you know, help you out of a jam if, if, we get it, if, we, if we get outside the specification. I know this was a kind of a short, I know a lot of this stuff you were already quite aware of, um, but this, this presentation really was designed as a primer for cold weather concreting because we're, we're definitely in that, that environment right now. So if you've got any questions, uh, the three of us would be willing to entertain it. All right, so um, Drew, um, can you guys see the chat but box right there on the orange? We have a couple a couple questions, one from Tyler and one from Mike. I don't know if you can see that. And speaking to the concrete plant, they are recommending avoiding fly ash as we enter into the fall. There's a comment from Tyler. Yeah, uh, this is Amy. I um, took over the computer. Great. Yeah, and, and Mike is our state design engineer, Mike O'Shea, with the NRCS. And he's right, fly ash slows the curing reaction, and it has a lower heat of hydration than cement. So it does make sense that they would, the concrete plant would be telling you to avoid fly ash. That's also a good sign that your concrete plant knows what they're doing for cold weather concrete. So if, you, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to either enter um, your question into the chat or uh, you can unmute yourself as well and ask the question. So Amy, do you see the next question from Matt? Do you ever see spec four including those recommendations for air temperatures versus amount of coverage needed, such as the table shown in the presentation? Um, the table shown in the presentation was, I, uh, yeah, it was a, a guide. Um, it goes by the nickname of Poop Scoops here in the Northeast, and it was just shorthand for us. Um, personally, I do not see Spec 4 ever including amounts of coverage needed because that's telling the contractor how to do their job, and we don't do that. We tell them the requirements we need, and they can make them however they want. Um, it's their responsibility to meet our requirements. We don't tell them how to do it. I guess the intent of that poop scoop is more so when you're standing out there as an inspector, are you in the range? You know, if it's 10 degrees outside and all you're seeing is visqueen, you got a problem. Can I believe Judy got that our website thing. Um, for those of you, the Appleton, Ottagamie County hosts the Appleton Tech Center for us, and there's literally a link to the Poop Scoops there. It's called Poop Scoops. And you can find that online if you want, um, if you want to read the, read the Poop Scoop and have it just as a rule of thumb. Great. Uh, any other questions for Amy, Drew, or Travis? I said this has been recorded and I will um, post this on our website and send it out. Okay, great. Brady has a question. Amy, do you want to see? When using type 3 cement, are the required conditions of the three consecutive curing days the same as others like the previously discussed types? Yes. Great, and if anybody else, um, Matt and Altuna posted the link um, to autogamy.org. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> the poop scoop link. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like uh, Russ and Rapids has a question, too. A good point to make for holding off on the project is that the landowner may not get paid his cost sharing right away due to some um, portions not getting finished, such as the fencing or seating. Yep, and I know Russ had a, a short course in cold weather concreting last year. He had a project that did a lot of cold weather concrete, so that's a voice of experience you're hearing there. Radio. 
Um, and Matt Rockweiler said, is using hot water in the concrete mix have any effect on the curing period time? The intent of the hot water is, try, is to try to keep it um, as close to original design conditions as possible with the 55 degrees. That's why you don't want the water to approach to, our, our spec says the water shouldn't exceed 100. If you get it too hot, you shock the concrete and bad things happen to your concrete mix. Great. All right, last chances to ask these guys a question. Uh, you, yes, you may definitely unmute yourself and ask the question if you'd like. Um, see, Tom Snyder is asking, in Northeast Wisconsin, type 3 concrete is not really readily available, so it is not an option to consider. Not sure. See, and I've seen type 3 already in mixed designs. Um, I, I think that it varies year to year on supply. I also think that in the Northeast, the DOT has sucked down a lot of type 3 because it's also early open to traffic for their transportation. Um, but I've seen type 3 already in the Northeast. So um, there are other options that Travis listed. You can still use type 1 and just add 100 to 200 more pounds of cement. You can add admixtures, but keep in mind that your get out of jail free card of three consecutive days goes away, depending on what you do. Okay. Uh, I believe Bob has a question he's going to unmute himself for. Probably there. Oh, this is Bob Popal. Just had a quick question on adding accelerators. It seems like when that's done, a lot of times. Oh, we lost you. Oh, let's unmute you. Oh, it looks like he got dropped quick. We'll come back to you, Bob. Um, we have another question. Will the field documentation need to be submitted with post-construction documentation? Yes, it will. That's part of your as-built. Well. Okay. Oh. Um, and Jim Todd, could you explain again why you need to maintain 32 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 days, even if your concrete is above 500 PSI after three days? It's because we don't just care about strength. We care about permeability, and we care about freestyle durability as well. After 500, you're right. If you freeze your concrete after 500 PSI, you can, and you only freeze it once. That's the other caveat. You can't have it freeze, warm up in the daytime, and then freeze back again at night. If you just freeze it once after 500 PSI, you can get your strength back, but you've lost your permeability and you've lost your freeze-thaw durability. So you've put little cracks in the concrete, and you're not going to get that back. All right, so we lost Bob for a second there. He's having a hard time getting back on, but he, uh, his question is, what is the risk of increased cracking when adding accelerants? It seems like it cracks more often when the accelerant is added. Something I, that's not something I've noticed. Um, accelerant, I guess my general recommendation would be to Make sure you're adding the accelerant based on the product requirements that you're not overdosing. You're, it, it shouldn't. Um, but I guess if there's a specific, um, it's not something I've seen. So I, we have a, a number of the, like the entire um, Northeast area office staff, tech staff is sitting here that's out of Appleton, and nobody's nodding that they've seen that. So none of us have seen that. Um, Bob, if you want to unmute yourself and explain it all, if you're still able to, um, if we hoping we don't drop you again. Um, otherwise, we can uh, get back on. Dave thinks maybe it's probably still froze. Oh, that the the concrete froze even though it you use the accelerant. I don't know, it's a possibility. That will cause cracking. Oh, uh, and Bob, feel free to maybe follow up with Amy 
um, after the webinar as well via email or maybe giving her a call if you want to continue to discuss that issue. Um, Matt is saying that an issue with the admixtures is a lot of concrete suppliers are not using them commonly, so the admixtures may throw off the slump and the air content, which creates more issues. And that's true. You do need a concrete supplier that knows how to use admixtures. So and that's why we have both water cement ratio requirements and slump requirements in Spec 4. So you can't admixture yourself to concrete that runs like water. Great. Any other questions? A few minutes left. Um, Amy, Drew, and uh, Travis, thank you so much. Um, you've, um, assuming that if anybody has any other questions, they could um, contact you? Absolutely. Great, thank you. Now here's the contact information now.